Number two, there's an immense amount of fear driving all of this. Um, I said that so many of the people I encounter on the street appear to be confused. And some of them actually are confused. One woman in, in, in particular was, was so committed to the relativistic view that we all have our own truths that when I asked her, um, you know, what would happen if it was my truth that she no longer exists, she looked me dead in the eyes and said, well, then, uh, then I don't exist. If it's your truth that I don't exist, then I don't. Now, I knew that women were being erased in our culture. I didn't realize that some of them were so eager to erase themselves. <laughs> but more often I encounter people who, whose confusion seems to be more of an affectation. You know, they give vague, dodgy answers to the questions because they're afraid to speak basic biological truths, especially afraid to do it on camera. There are many people I, I, we stopped on the street who refuse to talk to us at all, telling us that uh, they cannot talk about this with cameras rolling because they'll lose their job, their friends, and everything in their lives. So to be clear, their lives would be destroyed if they said something like, only women have babies on camera, or any similarly provocative statement. So gender ideology paves the way for itself with intimidation, threats, coercion, Fear is a big part of the story. The third thing I learned is that none of this is new, um, at least not as new as it seems anyway. So the roots of modern gender ideology can be traced all the way back to the 19th century, arguably even earlier than that, as the author Carl Truman explained in our film and also in his uh, great book, which I highly recommend, called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, if you've never seen that or read that book. Um, he talks about how the stage was set with the birth of, uh, of what philosophers, uh, some philosophers have dubbed psychological man. And that is when human beings began to prioritize their own emotional well-being above all else and to see emotional contentment as life's primary aim and purpose. So man moved away from defining himself based on and seeking joy in um, his roles and responsibilities within larger social structures, the family, the church, the nation, even the workplace moved away from that, and increasingly his life revolved around his self-perception. And whatever he did was in service to that self-perception. And now we've gotten to a point where for an individual, it's not only that, that their self-perception is the only thing that they care about, but they expect that it's going to be the only thing you care about. That their self-perception is your project. It's your chore. It's something that you have to take responsibility for. And that's the, the stage upon which the gender ideology drama has played out, and that really began to take its current shape in the mid-20th century thanks to the work of two hideously evil crackpot degenerates named Alfred Kinsey and John Money, uh, who together, along with a few others, shaped gender ideology as we know it, as we know it today. Excuse me. <clears throat> Number four. I learned that the ultimate goal of the gender ideology agenda goes far beyond gender. You know, the ultimate goal is to undermine, destroy, and erase truth itself. Leftism is relativism, and relativism is the belief that there is no objective truth, there is no shared reality, there's no universal fact that we all have to conform around and submit ourselves to. The relativist claims the right to invent his own universe for himself, even to the point of inventing himself. He seeks to be a self-created being, making and remaking himself as he sees fit, right down to the biological level. He believes that his ego overrides everything. Everything must bow before it. Language, institutions, science, even his own DNA must bow to his ego. This is why I found myself in the film speaking to Pontius Pilate over and over again. You know, what is truth? He asks in scripture. And the same thing the gender ideologue asks. Well, what is truth? Whose truth? Which truth? I was sitting in the same room as them, but they would not agree that we were situated in the same reality. So we can share a room, but we can't share a universe, they tell us. Because they get their own, they insisted. And that ultimately is what this is all about. But here's the good news, number five. Here's the other thing I learned. The final thing I learned from, from spending a year staring into this abyss is that we can win this fight. You know, gender ideology is insane, destructive, pervasive, ubiquitous, I believe the greatest evil that the world has ever seen. It's also 
beatable. It's weak and it's flimsy. You know, I get asked all the time by people, uh, do you really want to die on this hill? Is this the hill you want to die on, they always say to me. And, and they say that about everything I say. And in fairness, sometimes I do pick some rather odd hills to die on. But about this particular issue, I hear that a lot. Why, you know, why is this? Why, why do you want to die on this hill? Will I die on this hill? The answer is yes. You know, I, I will die on this hill. If there's any hill worth dying on, it's the hill of, of objective truth. Because if we surrender... Anyway. If we surrender, this is why I always ask conservatives who are, who are willing to surrender the hill, I, I say, well, what, what's your plan from here? What, what's next? So you're going to give up the hill of truth and reality, and then what? Where do you go from there? What hills are left after you've given that up? So yeah, I'll die on this hill. But I don't plan on it. I don't want to. As General Patton said back in the days before the military cared about equity and tolerance, he said, no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. He won it by making some other poor dumb da bastard die for his. And I kind of feel that way about the hills that we're all metaphorically fighting on. Um, I would say the same for the hill. You know, this, this fight for, for truth, this struggle against gender lunacy. We can win because the other side can be crushed under the weight of simple questions. I saw this happen time and time again before my very eyes, right? The learned, the educated, the, the experts crumpled and collapsed and panicked in front of me. Me, a, a bumpkin in a flannel armed with a high school diploma. Now, is that because I'm brilliant? That is my preferred adjective, as you know. That's how I self-identify. And handsome, thank you. That's how I identify. It's my truth. Um, but no, fortunately for me, brilliance is not actually required. If it was, then I couldn't be in this fight. All we have to do is just stand up, look this thing directly in its face, and ask it questions. Serve it a healthy dose of skepticism. Force it to explain itself. It has to explain itself. The burden of proof is on it. Gender ideology, the person who comes promoting gender ideology, they have to explain themselves. See, they always want to flip it around. And they say, well, what do you mean men can't have babies? Well, explain that. No, 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 no. I don't need to explain that. Okay, I am in alignment with the entire history of the human race. You came along 15 seconds ago and said that, no, everybody who's ever lived is wrong about this. Okay, well, you know what? You need to explain that. The burden of proof is 1,000% on you. So you prove to me that a man can have babies. You prove that to me. And if you can't, get the hell out of my face. Now, <laughs> sir. That wasn't... But they can't. They can't prove that. Not only can they not prove that a man can have babies, they can't even tell you what a man is. They can't answer anything. They have perched themselves on a limb that isn't even connected to a tree. They're anchored to nothing. Their worldview is empty and frail and flimsy. So we don't need to be armed with anything but a spine. For all the talk uh, accusing me and others of advocating violence or being terrorists, the only thing we're coming armed with is, yeah, a spine in questions. That's all we have. You just have to have enough to stand up straight and ask the questions that they cannot answer. The questions that, for that reason, are not supposed to be asked. But we must ask them. And if we do, we will win. And we must win, too. That's it for me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.